All point of views expressed on Shop Talk 360 are solely the point of views of the individuals and do not represent any company, organization, or group. Shop Talk 360, the industry's dedicated platform for commercial design, construction, and facilities. With more than 25 years building for national retail brands, an award-winning and best-selling author, keynote speaker, industry coach, and event producer, here's our host of Shop Talk 360, Grace Daly. Hey, Shop Talkers, welcome to our uh, podcast. Very, very excited to have uh, our guest, Paco Underhill, join us. Mr. Paco Underhill, thank you. Good afternoon. How are you? I am doing very well. I am so ecstatic to have you join us. I think I first read one of your books um, quite, dare I say, over a decade ago, maybe even longer. Um, you're the author of Why We Buy, The Science of Shopping. And actually, um, I'm probably going to uh, reread it again uh, after <laughs> after our podcast. But um, so excited to have you aboard with us. Thank you for joining us. Uh, why don't you give our audience um, a brief background of who Paco Underhill is? Well, thank you. That's very that's very kind of you. I often uh, introduce myself as a refugee from the world of the university. That some 35 years ago, I was a poor part-time adjunct instructor in a doctoral program in environmental psych- psychology or the effect that space has on people's behavior. My specialty back then was in commercial zoning issues, and I was part of the crew that would rewrite commercial zoning ordinances for different cities across the U.S., and I had my moment of professional epiphany on the roof of the Seafirst Bank building in Seattle. I was 60 stories up, and there was a stiff wind blowing. I was on the roof of the building installing the time-lapse cameras to record the traffic patterns on the streets below. Mm -hmm. I'm almost uh, two meters tall. I'm 6'5 when I stand up straight, but I really don't like heights. And on the roof of that building, as I felt the building rocking in the breeze, I realized Mm. that I had to reinvent my profession. A week later, I was standing at a bank in New York City getting madder by the moment and realized that the same tools that I'd been using to look at how a city worked, I could take into a bank or a store or an airport or a library or a museum and start to deconstruct how they worked, and I'd never go have, mm. have to go up to the roof of a building again. That's my story. <laughs> and that's a great story. I love it. Um, now, your work uh, has been covered in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, the New Yorker, and the Washington Post, um, and, and your organization, Envirocell. Uh, share with the audience a little bit about what Envirocell does. I founded Envirocell more than 30 years ago as a research and consulting firm. And our origins as a, as a firm were being a testing agency for prototype stores and prototype banks. We started doing that work in 1986. Um, since then, we have continued to hold our franchise with, with testing prototype stores, but we've moved into digital, digital spaces, we've moved into museums, we've moved into airports, Mm. we've moved into a host of different other places where services, people, and products meet, and whether that's in physical space or in cyberspace. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. And um, so from my world, primarily in the brick-and-mortar retail, restaurant, hospitality, commercial space environment. Um, with Enviroso, do you work primarily with brands, uh, retailers, 
or they're architects and designers, a combination of both? All of them here. I mean, if we look, for example, in the world of merchants, if we look at the 25 largest merchant organizations here in the U.S., we mm-hmm. either are working or have worked with two-thirds of them. If I look at the 50 largest merchants in the world, we have worked with half of them. We function in 46 countries or around the world. We have eight offices scattered around the globe, and I personally spend somewhere between 120 and 150 nights a year on the on the road. Wow. That's pretty cool. Um, so I love what you said about how you're not only of the physical plant, the brick and mortar, but also of the digital world. You know, so it's, one of mm-hmm. – One of our first major accounts in 1986 was helping AT&T launch their AT&T phone store, which was the first time that we had a major technology player making a commitment to retail. Um, That that work has taken us all over the world, meaning that we are working Mm. on retail and technology whether it's a telecom or whether it's a manufacturer uh, of telecom products or of smartphones or of uh, selling digital services. I mean, that's, that's everywhere. A typical person who works for, for Enviracell will, will probably work on three or four uh, continents over the course of a typical year. Hmm. Okay. Um, now, you tell us more about your new Science of Shopping course uh, that's coming up in February 20th, 20th to 22nd, actually, at uh, uh, LIM College. I personally have uh, lectured at, at universities all over the globe, and there's been a great deal of interest in being able to have a constant, concentrated program that looks at the science of shopping or the meeting of art and science as it deals with retail. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, this course will be uh, anchored at LIM here in here in New York, New York City. It's limited to a to uh, a small uh, small group of people. Um, it is uh, staffed by both LIM and in Viracel, and it's a very compre- comprehensive, intensive course on how to better understand um, how your retail setting works. We have run the course in the past. Uh, we've had students from all over the globe, and it's a it's a it's a fun, hard working. Um, session where you will come out of it with your glasses recalibrated and you will look at the world mm. differently. Mm. Okay, that sounds great. Um, now, with your four decades in retail, um, that's amazing. Uh, what is the future of retail in your opinion? Well, I'm not um, – I will – I'll. I'll back off from that question and say all over the world when we are looking at the evolution of retail, there are five things that seem to be happening everywhere, okay? Mm -hmm. One of the first is the recognition that our visual language is evolving faster than our spoken or written written word. How do we see? Mm. And that's being influenced by the Internet. It's being influenced by movies. It's being influenced by just a shrinking planet. But part of the mm-hmm. irony is the way I see at 65 and the way a millennial sees at 22 is different, meaning that the biology of our eyes are different. And there's a way of being able to look at how we see, and whether that's at my age or at a younger age, and be able to factor factor it in to the design or the structuring or the operations of whether it's a physical environment like a store or a museum or an airport or it's the cyber existence of a website or a telephone app. So that's theme one. Theme mm-hmm. two is is that we are watching a revolution in the interrelationship between genders. 
and that historically we have lived particularly in a built and retail world that was owned by men, designed by men, managed by men, and yet the most important customer was female. Mm. And that historically we sold women cosmetics, food, and apparel, and now we need to, to sell them everything. And one of the very fundamental dipsticks globally about whether it's a a web presence or it's a physical store is, is it female-friendly? Because if it's female-friendly, it ends up being friendly for everyone. Make sense? Hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Third, third, third issue is that all of us are moving through our lives with a clock ticking inside our heads. And that clock ticks at a relative degree of loudness. And for every time I either walk into a store or I log in online willing to spend however long it takes to get where I want to go, there's another time where I'm logging on or walking in the door desperate to get in and out as quickly as possible. And that all of us are leading multitasking lives, particularly our female con consumers or customers who are often mothers, wives, and bread earners. The the fourth issue is what is global and what is local, meaning the way someone shops in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and the way someone shops in Austin, Texas, they aren't that far apart, and yet they're very different communities, and there's a very different look and feel to how, to how things work. And merchants and marketers globally are trying to look at the difference between what is global in their brands or their execution, and what is local in in terms of how they make themselves relevant. And then the final issue relates to money, meaning that up until the mm -hmm. mid-1990s, the overwhelming majority of wealth was in the hands of an aristocracy who knew what they were buying. In 2017, the overwhelming majority of global wealth is in the hands of people who earned it in the course of their own lifetimes. And that there are distinct places on earth where money is young. Money is young in Shanghai. Money is young in Seoul. Money is young in Moscow. Money is not so young in New York. And it's not so young in London or in Paris. And therefore, the process of being able to sell often involves first the ability to educate, and that education both happens in terms of a more focused use of visual merchandising in store, but it also means recognizing that the smartphone that someone has in their pockets is used as a research tool even more than it's used as a shopping shopping tool. So part of what we're mm -hmm. looking at is a broader landscape where there is no question that the face of modern selling is changing drastically and that the world of stores is going to change more in the next five years than it has in the previous 50. That said, if we look at the broader body of the beast, all of us wear clothes, all of us mm -hmm. consume, all of us love our children, all of us are, are busy making meals and making homes and making whatever, it's just how we access those goods that are in question. Make sense? Mm. Mm hmm Okay. That's so I think what of what what is interesting in two thousand eighteen here is that when merchants and marketers at whatever age gather, there's a certain edge of bon ami on the surface. But part of the reason why we're gathering, whether it's at LIM or whether it's at the National Retail Federation big show is a certain level of anxiety because the rules are the rules are changing. Mm -hmm. Yes, they are rapidly. What, what would you say to uh, folks that have been building, who have been in the building industry, the brick and mortar industry, for the last thirty years, and are concerned with this rapid change? Well, certainly I've that we look at the at the U.S. landscape, and we are overstored. Almost every retail chain would be better off if they shed underperforming properties. That would be theme one. Mm -hmm. Theme mm -hmm. two is is that 
one of the revolutions that the world of retail design is going through is getting to a better mix of art and science. And one of the nasty, dirty secrets of retail design has has been until really the, the past decade that an, a large percentage of prize-winning stores were closed a year later because the critics loved them and the public didn't. Hmm. And that one of the key factors to the bricks and mortar world is keeping a very close eye on who the public is and keeping a very close eye on that mix between what you sell, how you sell it, and what the operating culture is. And that that uh, trident here is something that the progressive merchant and designer is constantly having to tune. So very recently, I've chatted with some technology folks, you know, Beacon Technology and all types of other technologies that are being infused or being looked at being infused into traditional retail brick-and-mortar spaces. And what we found in the last two years is that it's almost as if the consumer is not ready to embrace that. So, for instance, it was rolled out to a large uh, uh, to a segment of a large uh, national drug chain store, but it didn't really go anywhere because the consumer wasn't ready for it. So then I they would kind of pulled back. That. Mm-hmm. Okay. I would dispute that. I mean, one of the things that we are finding is that there are any number of ways to be able to put the technology inside a store. Okay. The mm-hmm. problem is, is what do I do with the data that it generates? that we are much better at collecting data than we are figuring out what it means. And particularly when we deal with a modern drugstore where the exact same customer may be walking in on a Monday shopping for herself. She may be walking in on a Tuesday shopping for her children, and she may be walking in on a Thursday and shopping for her for her parents. So I... One of the things that we have to trade off is that what is the technological edge and what's the human intel that we use to be able to process it. And the fact that we can collect the the data doesn't necessarily mean that 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 data is meaningful, either for the merchant or on the other side for for the customer. Okay. So what you're saying, if I understand. Mm -hmm. Yes. And part of what we're looking at is that I have any number of of our, uh, I would say, Fortune 50 clients in retail who have bought Beaker, uh, uh, Beacon systems, installed them inside the store, and then have not been able to figure out how they actually are going to use them on an ongoing basis. Okay. So a more accurate statement would be, from your point of view, is that the merchant it's not so much consumers are not embracing it. The merchants haven't taken that data the next step. To well, the question B the comes consumer? here is, is, is whose responsibility is it to take it that next step? Is it the okay. technologists that provide the technology who uh-huh. are uh, leaving it at the dashboard and say, here, it's installed, find a way to use it? Or is it the merchant who is going, if I install this, are you going to help me be able to figure out how I'm going to use it and and, and use it on an ongoing basis? Hmm. Or do you think, as think an this, industry, it should be collaborative? I think it, should, it, it, it needs to be, we need to figure out whether technology's role in the world of retail is as a software seller or as a true consultant who is not only collecting, processing, but has their boots on the ground figuring out how they're going to use it. Hmm. Okay. Makes sense? Yes, makes sense. Okay, and, and it's uh, um, part of what we re- recognize, too, is that 
the role of technology at retail is in a great deal of evolution and that many of the systems that we are looking at now I think are transitional systems getting us to whatever is next and that one mm -hmm. of the places in the world where that technology is actually being used best is in places outside the U.S. where the markets are much more focused and much more homogeneous than the markets are here. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, next part of this is, yes. as I sit on the corner of 20th and Broadway, I have spent 20 years with technologists knocking on my door going, here is what I can do. Can you figure out how I use it? Rather than, Got it. Uh, yeah, w rather than I have recognized a problem out there, and this is and what I'm the problem solve. is, and this yeah. is how I have come up with a system to be able to solve that problem. Yeah. So it's kind of like the cart before the horse. I can remember probably, it may, it may not be 20, 20 years ago, but maybe 17, a group of technologists coming in and saying, we have a software package that we was originally developed for the military to track tank movements from satellites. And we would like to take that same software package, install it into camera systems that we, in, we put inside of banks and stores, and rather than tracking tanks, be able to track people. Mm. Okay. And the question becomes here is, what do I do with it? Do I use it to be able to look at staffing issues? Do I be able to look at adjacency issues? Do I look at it to look at conversion or non-conversion? And how does the camera pick up on all of those different types of measures? So over the past 30 years, we at Envirosol have used more than a thousand different measures, more than a thousand different measures, and that we have a standardized set of about 30 of them. Of those 30 measures, 40 to 50 percent of them could be digitized now, meaning that we could we could collect that information from some form of either camera or sensing device. But there's still an awful an, an awful lot of that data or awful lot of that infer, information that we cannot capture. And that having some boots on the ground to be able to actually look at it does make a difference. Do you want me to give you an example? Yes, please do. Okay. Um, let's say we have a sensor at a doorway that, that counts people coming in the door, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we can calibrate those sensors so that they can do a reasonably good um, job at differentiating men and women based on size, size, movement, other, other factors. If you and your daughter walk into a Kroger store or you walk into Macy's uh, and the sensor picks you up, does it register you as an individual or does it register you as a shopping unit? And therefore, when we calculate what a conversion ratio is, is it that you and your daughter go shop for shoes and you buy a pair of shoes and the conversion rate is 100% or is the conversion rate 50% be, be, because they've measured you both as female but you're both separate? Hmm. We could take that same thing and look at a family or look at a, a group of teenage girls that walk in to go shopping or uh, you shopping with your husband or you shopping with your husband and your teenage, teenage daughter. And therefore, when we start to look at store counts and conversion rates, um, Yes, at a 60,000-foot level, we can measure the number of bodies walking in the door versus the transactions. And if we do it from day to day to day, there's a certain validity to that measure, and that is completely valid. But if I have a better sense as to the shopping groups that are walking in the door and what the conversion rates are there, then that's something that actually has some 
has some uh, traction, that you could do some things inside the context of, of the store to execute I against and make a difference. So mm-hmm. part of the difference we're looking at is what is a dipstick and what's a true indicator. Makes sense? Okay. Yes, makes Good. sense. Makes sense. Okay. And, um, and so a, a, as we're moving forward here, certainly we are in this confluence of being able to try to figure out what are the types of data that we can aggregate across a large group of people walking in the door, and what are the types of data that are anchored in an individual consumer, meaning that if you walk in and the Bluetooth function on your phone is turned on and the merchant can understand who you are and knows who you are based on that Bluetooth signal, and then they can uh, do a SMS or a text message to you about what's on sale on another floor of that same store, is that really an asset, and is it cool the first time, or is it frustrating for you the sixth time it happens when basically mm-hmm. you're looking at your phone be- because you're you're worried about the text message from your teenage daughter who is coming home? Mm-hmm. From mm-hmm. So, and one of the things that's a very delicate act is what is intrusive, and this is a particularly po- poignant moment because we are looking at the core of American consumers, which are the millennials, that are getting to the point in their lives when they are they are um, starting to have a much more complex series of responsibilities. They're starting families, they're coming to home buying a little late, they're budgeting issues that they have to look at, and they're 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 also less focused on themselves and often more you know focused on 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 a family here and once you get to that point the way in which you access information and the way you think about privacy becomes very very different mhm sure how old are you how old am i um well i so just I'm told you that i'm 65 Okay, and I will tell you, I am 51. Um, All right. Well, well, part of what we know is that um, in the evolution of us as shoppers, okay, that once mm-hmm. we reach roughly a age 40, about 80% of our weekly purchases are replacement products, meaning that you've decided at your age the kind of mustard the kind of coffee, mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. kind of soft the soft drinks, the kind of dog food that your dog wants, the kind of beer that your husband likes, and the kind of shampoo that you would prefer. Um, in the best of all possible cases, if we offered you three hours uh, of new time to your life, if your house or your home could do some of the shopping for you, particularly for that replacement products, wouldn't you take that offer? Sure. It saves time, absolutely. It saves time that you can spend exercising, playing with your dog, focused on your mother who's a little troubled, whatever. But Mm -hmm. part of what we're looking at there is that there's a stage in our lives to which we are interested in whether in acquisitions that we think have the potential to be transformational. If I'm 18, I can play with cosmetics and hair care. If I'm 25, I can experiment with outfits. But once I've reached age 40, a lot of those things have been taken off the table. Mm. And we are dealing with a modern shopping culture, particularly here in the U.S., where a significant number of us here um, are asking the question, why should I have to go to CVS or to Kroger and buy the same things over and over again? Mm-hmm. So a technology uh, like Amazon Dash would, the Dash button, I think it's called, would 
serviceness, kind of replenishment of these um, I I just did a global tour for one of the major technology companies talking about the role of the Internet of Things in different continents mm-hmm. across the world. And I think it's it's a it's a very interesting proposition. And whether it's that Amazon button or whether it's a smart refrigerator or even a smart mm-hmm. kitchen that mm. keeps track of all of the RFID codes that you bring in or is is uh, is you do uh it it scans it and your trash basket records it when you empty it or somebody is looking at the velocity at which you consume different things there are a variety of ways of getting to it and i think that that amazon button may be very useful near term but i think there's probably a more integrated system um, mm-hmm. in our lexicon not that far down the road. Okay, very interesting. Um, now, my next question, with most of the Shop Talk 360 audience have been in the design, building, and facilities maintenance of primarily retail and restaurant and hospitality commercial spaces. So there's been obviously a huge shift in the last decade with malls um, and mall stores. What are your thoughts on the malls? Well, almost every other place in the world, people are building malls, not malls. So that if Mm -hmm. you go to the to to the uh, Australia, or you go to the Netherlands, or you go to Istanbul here. Somebody mm-hmm. is recognizing that somebody wants to live, shop, and work all in the same place. Yeah. If we look here in the U.S. at, at you know, progressive neighborhoods or progressive uh, complexes, I, I look at Pont City Market in Atlanta where someone can live, play, exercise, and work and not have to climb in their cars to drive. If we mm-hmm. look at most U.S. shopping malls, they were but ugly the day they were opened, some, in some cases 40 years ago, and haven't gotten sure. any prettier. Uh-huh. The tenant mix inside those malls is very, very narrow compared to other places in the world, meaning that if you don't go to a mall on Friday, grocery store, a dry cleaning, a a, a church, a library, or maybe even a school that's uh, attached to that mall, m- much less a daycare center, which is something that you go to other places in the world. A uh, mall functions like an, like an edge city. It's a place where people can accomplish a lot of things. Um, and this is something that's sort of late coming here to the U.S. So we can look at the time, that Time Warner Center in New York City. Mm-hmm. There is a Whole Foods in the basement, okay? Yes. Mm-hmm. Over the over the complex, over the mall, is office space and residential housing. And people are willing to be able to spend a premium to be in a place that is convenience-driven. And if they wanted to shop that Whole Foods in their bedroom slippers, there's an elevator that will take them right down. Mm-hmm. So when I look at the modern American shopping mall and I look at some of the troubled properties, Mm -hmm. part of what I'm looking at is the sea of asphalt that surrounds them. And that sea of asphalt is an unrealized asset because it could be something else. Mm -hmm. That sea of asphalt could be housing. It Mm -hmm. could be office space. It could be... um, hotels. It could be something else. And that we are at a point when there are so many communities across the U.S. where there's a generation of uh, Americans who are looking at housing change issues. If you're living Mm -hmm. in Minneapolis and you live in a suburb of Edina and you're getting into your late 50s or early 60s, and you go, you know what, it's time for me to shop, to stop shoveling snow. You know what, I just don't want to have to shovel snow. 
Do okay. I really want yeah. to move to Florida? Do I really want to move to Arizona? I'm, under the best of all possible worlds, I'd like to go visit those places, but I'd like to be around where my friends and family and my daughters and my grandchildren are. And there are not a lot of options. Whereas if they, if the local shopping mall weren't a mall but were an all where I could go live in a high-rise building, not have to shovel snow, I'd have a, a stop and shop or whatever, a Kroger in the in the basement of my building. I could be able to walk to you know the Mall of America or wherever it is. Um, and when I wanna, wanted to flee to uh, Florida, there was a, a very convenient limo service from my building or my complex that would take me to Minneapolis Airport where I could climb on a plane and, and be a snowbird for two weeks. Hmm. So I, I, I think what we're looking at is in that landscape of, of U.S. malls. I was just walking malls just this past weekend. I have a mm-hmm. group of Brazilian mall executives that I've worked with for almost 10 years that are visiting, and I was trying to figure out where I was going to take them. And, yeah, we walk into a modern American mall, and um, there are a lot of vacancies out there. Sure, yep. And um, those vacancies are, are you know, the, an empty J.C. JC, JC Penny store. There was an empty mm-hmm. uh, Uniqlo store. I mean, there, there are... A lot of pullbacks going on here, and what do I do with that vacant space? And that's a that's a poignant question. I think there was an interesting line that I saw that uh, you know ten years ago, mall owners turned their nose up noses up at gyms or making you renting space for to have a gym in the mall, mm-hmm. and now because they weren't quote unquote traffic traffic drivers. And now mm-hmm. there are many shopping malls that go, wow, having a gym or a daycare center or something like that might be a very good idea because it means that maybe they don't shop every time they come here, but at, at least they're coming here. Yes, great. And if you go to a, to a Westfield property in Sydney here, you'll find a grocery store, a gym, a daycare center, and sometimes government offices all in the same property. Mm-hmm. We are looking for a better collaboration of public and private interest to be able to take the mall industry and, and move it to where it needs to go here in the U.S. Yes, and and so it's a matter of time before that cycle goes through then, possibly. Well, you know, I think it's a matter of a bunch of different things. Some of it is just, is I would say, clueless guy stuff. If I go to a shopping mall in Thailand... Okay. Uh-huh. There are floors of the parking garage that are for women only. No kidding. Yeah. If I go to uh, to a Korean uh, strip mall or grocery store, some of the prime parking spaces immediately closest to the building are designated as female only. Hmm. And how often... When was the last time you were creeped out in a parking lot? Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, and that's this is a question I have. I'm, I'm six foot four or six five when I was in that street. My wife tells me that somebody would beat me up every week if I, if, if I weren't that big. But I can stand in front of an audience of, of, of men and women and I go, how many women in this crowd? can tell me about an unpleasant experience that they have had either in a in a parking lot over the sure. past month and half yeah. the women in, in the evening room hours will put up of their course. Mm-hmm. it's it's mm-hmm. and you know doing little stuff like managing a parking lot is is just an easy step and you know what when when our korea office interviews male Shoppers and go. Do you resent the fact that they're female-only floors or parking spots? The men say, "I really don't care." Interesting. Now, I wonder if that was to be implemented in our country. I wonder what the men would say. 
Or do you think they'll say the same? I don't care. Well, if you go to PacoUnderhill.com, okay, mm-hmm. there is a recent mm-hmm. column that I wrote called Amazon and Parking, talking about the fact, talking about how parking lots, particularly at strip malls with big boxes, might be transformed so that we'd help some bricks and mortar clients be able to better compete with Amazon. Mm. And that Amazon's purchase of Whole Foods is directly related to the fact that there's a large percentage of uh, Americans who can accept deliveries at the office and can't aren't at home to accept deliveries there. Mm-hmm. And that if there were an efficient way to be able to order online and pick up at the store, that was truly painless. I think a lot more of us might consider it. Sure. Where do you Uh, live? I live, I'm a native New Yorker, born and raised, uh, but just about five years ago, uh, four years, four and a half years ago, I moved down to South Florida. So I'm I'm close to the West Palm Beach area. All right. Good for you. Good for you. Well, the the point being here is that um, if we look at the median median, uh, American household, they have an Mm -hmm. income that's just over $59,000, okay? Of those households, more than half of them, there is no one at home between basically 8 in the morning and 6 in the evening. Mm-hmm. and that there is no secure way of somebody being able to leave a package on their on their doorstep. And even if there's a camera system on the doorstep, that is a passive security device, not an active one. Mm-hmm. But if there were a way where you could swing by your local Walmart, you could pull up to a you know drive-in uh, pickup lane. You will have texted them 30 minutes earlier saying that you're on your way, and they load your order right in the back of your car in plastic buckets, in a plastic bin, not lots of cardboard, not lots of packing material, because one of mm. the nasty under bellies of e-commerce is that yeah. it is distinctly unecological. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That is true. Whereas if you had the uh, ability to pick up at your local Kroger or your local Walmart or your local Best Buy and you just had standardized bins, plastic plastic bins, storage bins, mm-hmm. and if you bought three bins in and you turned those three bins in and you got three more bins full of stuff, you could eliminate about 40% of the cardboard consumed in the USA. Mm. Isn't that that interesting? Yes, that's really interesting. uh, Part of what we're looking for is just a, is a, is a, is moving is moving forward, and the U.S. has to recognize that the epicenter of modern retail left North America about 30 years ago, and that if we go to other to other places, there's some very workable models where they work stuff out, and we just need to you know beg beg borrow or steal them. Okay, I love that. Wow. Um, well, last question. And then we're going to wrap up. So, Paco, if you had one word that best describes the retail brick-and-mortar industry to you right now, what would your one word be and why? Challenged. Challenged. You know, you know one of the things that is very true of, about retail historically is that we have birth, life, death, and compost. Mm. And if I look at the 10 largest merchants in 1960 or 1970 or 1980 or 1990, that list always changes. 
and that um, either we are reflective of the change that we are going through. And one of the things I love about working in retail is that if we understand the difference between what made a good store in, in 2000 and what makes a good store in 2018, part of those those differences are the evolution of us because retail is the reflection of social change. Mm-hmm. And I love the fact that over my, you know, 35 years of, of, of working in the broader world of shopping, that there are some things that have stayed the same, and there's a lot of stuff that's changed. Thank you for listening to me. <laughs> Thank you, Paco. You know, I feel like there's so much more we can chat on. Um, so we will definitely have to have a follow-up uh, podcast, um, maybe possibly after your uh, Science of Shopping course. Um, in February, New York City. Um, and now, if folks wanted to learn more about your Science of Shopping course, should they go to your PacoUnderhill.com email, uh, 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 rather website? Or they should they should they should go to the company uh, address, which is Envirocell.com. E N V I R O S E L L dot com. Wonderful. Paco, thank you so much for chatting with us. It's been very enlightening for me, and I'm sure my audience has well. And I look forward to um, a future podcast uh, or possibly having you on one of our Shop Talk 360 panels that we do in New York quite often. That would be wonderful. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, for, thank, you for, thank you for having me. Okay, have a great holiday season, and we'll talk again really soon. Good. Thanks for joining Shop Talk 360, real conversations in the commercial design, construction, and facilities industry. You can reach out to us at grace at gracedaily.com.